What's up, everybody? Thanks, as always, for supporting the show. It would mean a lot to me if you would take a second to scroll down and hit that subscribe button to the Hoops Tonight YouTube channel, and then follow me on social media on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter so you guys don't miss any of our content over the course of this season. All right, let's talk some basketball. Okay, first question. Hi, Jason. I was wondering what your thoughts were on the Warriors' potential starting five. If it were up to me, I'd start Steph, Pods, Kaminga, Wiggins, uh, Kaminga or Wiggins, Draymond at the power forward, and then Trace Jackson, Davis, or Looney at center. This, however, leaves much to be desired. Steph would have to have a top five season this year. Pods would have to have one hell of a breakout season proportionate to the responsibility we're putting on him. And Kaminga would have to take a defensive leap. And Wiggins would have to have a bounce back season. Draymond can't regress defensively. And Trace Jackson, Davis, and Kevon Looney would have to be able to defend other dominant bigs while putting pressure on the rim. All in all, I'm not too high on us this year. But that could just be doom and gloom talk because of the last two years. I wasn't too upset we missed out on Lori, but I don't know what this team does moving forward to contend. Keep up the great work. So as far as the starting lineup goes, I think it's an obvious answer. I would take a page out of J.J. Reddick's book, which is, yeah, it's an imperfect lineup, but go with the lineup that was your best lineup last year. The Lakers lineup with with Rui Hachimura at the three is an imperfect lineup, but it's their best lineup. So it's their best way to go for now until they decide whether or not they want to invest more in this season and make some sort of personnel trade, right? Well, what was the best lineup for the Warriors last year? It was obvious. It was the it was Draymond at center next to Kaminga and Wiggins. So instead of choosing between one of Kaminga and Wiggins and going two bigs, I would just go Wiggins at the three, Kaminga at the four, Draymond at the five. That was their best lineup by far. It was their most used lineup by far. They had 232 minutes with pods at the two. They were plus 12 per 100 possessions, which is great. They were great on both ends of the floor, and they rebounded well. They had 157 minutes with Clay at the two instead. They were plus 18 net rating. Great on both ends of the floor. They weren't great on rebounding with that unit, but they weren't terrible either. So, like, that was your best. You were were really, really good with the Kaminga Wiggins dream on front court. So, like, is it a perfect lineup? No, it's it's got some tricky spacing. Kaminga's a little bit of a ball stopper. There are issues with that lineup. Not a ton of offensive firepower, but when in doubt, when you have a flawed roster and flawed options, when in doubt, just play your five best players. That will carry you through the regular season until you can decide whether or not this team is worth investing in and you make some move to try to balance out a more complete starting lineup. Hey, Jason, love the show. If you were the coach of the Bucks, would you tell Giannis to stop shooting threes? With a 27% three-point percentage, he's obviously hurting the offense when he does it, and he's not keeping the defense honest because they leave him wide open. Do you think there is any value in those shots whatsoever? Even the announcers call him out for it and say the defense should be sending him thank you cards every time he does it. He took 171 threes in 2023 and had the worst three-point percentage out of all players who had as many attempts. Love to hear your thoughts. Thanks. So ironically, the threes are his most efficient jump shot. Um, He shot 33% on mid-range jump shots last year. That's just 0.66 points per shot. He shot 27% on threes. That's 0.8 points per shot. So like he was kind of efficient on long twos. He shot like 39% on long twos that were outside of 17 feet, according to Synergy. But even that is just 0.79 points per shot, which is less than the 0.8 points per shot he was getting on threes. He was really, really bad on short-range, mid-range jump shots that are like inside of 17 feet last year. Now, here's the thing. I understand why he's trying to build out that shot in the long run. It's about saving energy. It would be great if Giannis could take three or four threes a game and hit him 33% of the time. So he gets one point per shot. Because then he could rest, right? So like my my guess is like I I would take it out entirely in the postseason. There's never a reason for him to take a three in the postseason unless it's like late clock and he just has to get something up on the rim. Which, unfortunately, he's done the opposite of that in his career. He's actually taken more threes in his career. He's taken barely over two a game in his regular season career. He's taken three a game in his regular season career. Or his postseason career. So, like, he needs to cut those out. But when he's in the 82-game season and you're in the Eastern Conference, like, the Bucs aren't going to fall into the play-in. There's not enough good teams in the Eastern Conference, right? Like, if they were in the West, totally different issue. But in the East, they're they're not going to have to worry about that. So who cares if you lose a game or two off of some inefficient shots from Giannis if he's trying to build that out in the long run? If he wants to take two or three threes a game as part of his big picture goals, 
who cares? Because it could eventually help you. But yeah, I do think he needs to stop taking them in the playoffs. I love how Jason, I love how the Lakers ranking is perpetually lifted by this pending trade that Jason has been fantasizing about for the last two seasons. <laughs> so a couple things. First of all, the Lakers are next in my power rankings. I have them at eight. Uh, pretty much in line, uh, Vegas has them at ninth in championship odds. The only team that Vegas had above the Lakers that I didn't is the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, and it's very different to make a trade when you've got two top 10 players on your team. Like the Lakers have a strong foundation. So a small tweak can go a long way. When you've got two top 10 players, you craft really small and achievable roles. When you put good basketball players into small achievable roles that fit their skill set, you get enhanced returns as opposed to diminishing returns, right? And so here's the thing. Like I I had another mailbag question. The, uh, someone said, okay, so the Lakers are getting in the fringe tier because they can hit on a trade and have two first-round picks. Do you know how many teams below the Lakers have first-round picks and have plenty more to offer? Yeah, you're right. There are a lot of teams that have more to trade than the Lakers, but they're not trading and adding a player or adding players to a team that already has two top 10 players. That's the difference. The Lakers can make a small tweak and get more in return out of it because they have such a strong foundation. As far as the Bucks go, because I had uh, um, I had a, a specific comment that was complaining about uh, the Bucks being below the Lakers. The Lakers were better than the Bucks last year, even without a trade being made. They had just two fewer wins in a much tougher conference. They beat the Bucs head-to-head both times, even though LeBron James didn't play in either game. They had more wins against teams that were in the top 10 in point differential. The Lakers were just, they, they just had a more impressive and more successful season last year than the Bucs, in my opinion. So, like, again, like, you you can argue one way or another. I have them divided by hairs in this tier. Like, the fifth team and the 11th team, you could jockey them all around as much as you want. I have the Lakers at eight. I'm sure all the people that hate the Lakers have them lower. I, I'll, I'm going to save most of my Lakers positivity talk until Monday because on Monday we are covering the Lakers as number eight in our power rankings. I'll make my case there. If you guys disagree and you want to make a basketball case for why you think I'm wrong about the Lakers, throw them in the mailbag question on Monday's show and we'll get to those later on in, the, uh, uh, in this series. If you were coaching a contender level team, maybe in the six to 10 range, how would you approach the in-season tournament? I loved watching it as a fan, but I'm uncertain how a coach would feel about this new institution Institution after year one. I love this question. And I think the answer is very simple. You try to win it. No question. You win it. You go and you try to win the damn thing. It's about establishing a culture in your franchise that is entirely focused on winning. NBA fans like to pretend that the regular season doesn't matter, but NBA history tells us that the team that wins the title almost always attacks the regular season from start to finish. They're, the whole like flip a switch late in the year thing, that doesn't happen. It's even rare for a team like Dallas to flip the switch at the tail end of the year and go on a finals run. And by the way, they got their ass kicked when they got there. Like The team that wins the title is great from start to finish. Winning is part of their character. Real competitors see the in-season tournament as another opportunity to prove themselves. I actually expect the in-season tournament trophy will become more and more prestigious as the years go by because I do think we will see the great teams in the league consistently win it, consistently go after it because that's just what winners do. And I think we'll even see the seeding games take on another layer of intensity this year because we had some teams that didn't qualify for the tournament last year because you have to take those games very seriously. So I'm a huge fan of the in-season tournament. I think it's going to become a bigger part of the NBA with each passing season. Hey, Jason, when you get to the Mavs, I remember you suggesting earlier that the offense would be a lot better and resilient if they played five out, five out with more movement, especially with the clay addition in the offseason. I definitely agree with that. However, in some other recent videos, you made it seem like you were skeptical the Mavs would even do so, given how they empower Luka Ball and that Luka has a very narrow play style. I don't think that's correct. The Mavs do play five out a bunch, the 22 uh, the 2022 Western Conference Finals run was built on it. The reason they hadn't done much this year is because Maxi Kleba was hurt and he was the center that made that possible. I also don't think Mark, the Mark Cuban interview is really that relevant because he isn't the coach and he doesn't even have control of basketball operations anymore. The part about Mark Cuban's fair. Like, uh, I, I am keeping an open mind about Dallas. I'm going to 
make up my mind about how they play when I watch them play. Like I, I want to see what they do. Uh, but this is the biggest misconception that I see in the YouTube comments around here. Five out does not mean five shooters. Five out does not mean a center that can shoot threes. Those are elements that can be utilized in five out. And you're right, in a very literal sense, when they would play with Max Kleba at the center, Maxi Kleba at the center, and they had him screen and pop to the top of the key, that is technically five out because everyone's operating on the perimeter. However, five out is a very complicated play style that enca encapsulates a bunch of different elements. And one of the key elements that the vast majority of real five out teams use is ball and player movement. Again, the Golden State Warriors ran one of the best and most devastating five out attacks in the league with two non-shooters on the floor at all times. They'd have Andre Iguodala and Draymond Green, or Draymond Green and Kevon Looney, or Draymond Green and Andrew Bogut. They consistently had non-shooters on the floor, but it was five out because those bigs, those non-shooters, were screening and passing fulcrums that operated from the outside. Dribble handoff, roll into the paint, not available, catch, go into the next action, right? Swing pass, go to the next action. That's the whole point. Is like. Ball, like five out is about ball and player movement. And the paint is not occupied except for temporarily on cuts, flashes, rolls, and drives. That So again, like I'm not asking for Dallas to employ a stretch five and to run their exact same offense just with a center that can shoot. I want them to flow from side to side with multiple guys running action. Because that is what makes you truly hard to guard. I am skeptical that they'll do that. But I'm keeping an open mind to see if they will once we get into the season. Hi, Jason. Do you think this upcoming season might be LeBron's last season as a top player? Or when do you think we'll see a significant decline in his game? Thanks. I think this is it. I think this is the last real chance LeBron has to make some noise. I think it depends, like I mentioned, on a trade. But like, I don't think, I think after this season, we're going to start seeing some pretty substantial decline from LeBron. I feel like this is the last good one. I feel like you're setting yourself up to rank the Wolves lower than they should be by referring to them as a bad offense. Can you elaborate on how, as a middle of the pack offense during the regular season, they were a bad offense, especially when you noted that Ant's elevation in the playoffs was a step you expect him to carry over to this season. Regardless of that, the Wolves were not a bad offense in the playoffs. They weren't a top offense, but they were far from bad. Bad is all relative. It's relative to the other playoff caliber team. So yeah, they were 17th in defensive rating or offensive rating, but like this league has 10 really bad teams at the bottom that are outliers, right? So like that's the important thing to consider. It's all we're discussing this relative to the other championship teams. They also played 146 minutes of clutch basketball last year. So important late game minutes, less than five minutes left inside of five points. They had a 104 offensive rating in the regular season in 146 minutes of clutch basketball. That is abysmal. All three of their clutch losses against Dallas, they lost three games that went to crunch time against Dallas. They had an offensive rating of 80 in those three games, in those three situations. They turned the ball over on 24% of their possessions in those three clutch performances. So again, are they a really bad offense relative to the rest of the NBA? No, they're below average. But are they bad relative to the real competitive teams at the top of the league? You bet your ass they are. I do agree that Ant's elevation in the playoffs was a step in the right direction, and I think the, the Wolves will be a better offense this year. I think they'll go up from 17 to something probably closer to 12 or 13. But if they still have those issues scoring in the half court because teams don't really have to guard Jaden McDaniels, because teams don't really have to guard Rudy Gobert, because teams don't really have to guard and kill Alexander Walker, whoever it is that's out there in those moments, then that's still going to be an issue. But we'll get into that in more detail when we get to the Wolves. And uh, they are considerably higher on this list, if I remember correctly. Can you touch more on the Miami Heat and how Bam's three-point development can help transform their offense? Personally, I think it's going to take them to another level when it comes to handoffs and playing at the top of the key. It just adds another element. Specifically, when Jimmy posts up and Bam spaces to the corner, I think it'll be a great look. would love to hear what you think. It'll help. 
But in order for a shooter to actually create space for an offense, he has to be guarded like a shooter. That's a huge difference, right? It's like we were talking about earlier with Giannis. It's not keeping the defense honest if they're never actually guarding you out there. There's only a real multi-possession benefit for shooting if you make enough of them to where they actually start accounting for you with their base defensive scheme. So like he needs to hit enough of them at a high enough rate to where he's actually being shadowed by his defender. If his defender can dig down and just offer a late contest and you're not burning them enough, it just doesn't matter enough. But yeah, if he does unlock that part of his game, if he does become a shooter that people have to guard, that's great. Even more than just the spacing stuff with Jimmy posting up or anything like that, it'll unlock two big looks for them. And not two big looks with like Kevin Love, or I heard some talk about the Heat potentially looking at like Vucevic. It, it, that, that sort of thing, you don't get the benefits of two bigs if it's a finesse big that doesn't bring much physicality to the table. Like If you have a big defensive center that you can play next to Bam because now he's a good shooter, that unleashes a whole other element to your offense. Or to your defense, I should say. Bradley Beal coming off the bench is what Phoenix needs. As you say, they need a professional defender in the starting lineup, and that can be Royce O'Neal. Beal, Book, and Durant is already starting to give you diminishing returns. Another ball handler added to the mix is not it. Here's the thing. This is not going to happen because they just fired their coach, and one of the many reasons was Bradley Beal was unhappy with his role. Bradley Beal wants the ball more. He... And it's crazy. I went back and watched a good chunk of the Wolves Sun series for our Suns preview. Bradley Beal was so bad. He was so bad. And it's tough because, like, it's a different role than anything he's done in his career. He's off the ball the majority of the time. It's so much more about knocking down open shots, moving without the basketball, driving closeouts. And they desperately need him because he's one, he's probably the best athlete in the starting lineup. They desperately need him to guard the ball and to do it well. But he did a poor job guarding the ball in the Minnesota series, and he did a poor job functioning as a cog in the offense in the series. So, like, it's a tough role, and he's struggling with it. The truth about what Bradley Beal needs to do is it actually does make more sense on this team for him to function as a sixth man so that you can have a better athlete that's committed to the work in the starting lineup that can guard the other team's best player, be more of a connective piece on offense. Then when Brad checks into the game, he can come in guns blazing on offense and have the ball in his hands the whole time. Then if he's th- then you close the game with him, right? That Bradley Beal makes too much money to be traded and is not good enough for you to just put the ball in his hands and put Devin Booker and Brad and and Kevin Durant off the ball. That's a misallocation of resources. So in order for Bradley Beal to maximize his potential on this particular team, he's got to become a souped up overqualified role player. And I just don't think he's willing to do that. And so I, 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 I'm not sure that there's really a good answer. And I expect it to look a lot like it looked last year. Hey, bro, another great episode. No one breaks it down the way you do. Keep up what you're doing. Thank you for the kind words. Can you talk about the potential impact of Matas, uh, Matas Buzelis can have on the rebuilding Chicago Bulls team? That young man is so dynamic. I think he's the steal of the draft. We had a question a few weeks back, a mailbag question talking about like what the Bulls should do as part of their rebuild process. And I talked a lot about how you got to find out what you got. You got to find out what Josh Giddy has. And Matas Buzelis is another example of that. Like give him lots of opportunity and find out if you have something there. Once you identify what your foundation is, then you can start to look at their strengths and weaknesses and how to build around them. But you got to find out what your foundation is first. And there was not really much to get excited about in terms of young players in that organization. Matas Buzelis is the first guy in a while where it's like, hey, let's see what this guy's got. And I'm excited to watch him too. We'll be covering him very closely this year. Last question. Jason, if you were the Magic General Manager, what would you do in the next calendar year to take the team from Tier 2 to Tier 1? So the key here is you don't want to jump the gun. If I had to improve the Magic in the short term, I would bring in a skill guard. Let's just say like D'Angelo Russell, for instance. And I'd have him handle the rock. And I'd have Paolo and Franz operate more off the ball. Because those guys are really struggling right now to be decision makers and half-court shot creators. Right? They're struggling. Especially in like slow down physical environments. Right? A skill guard that you can compensate for by doing all the dirty work and creating an opportunity for him to just set guys up with quality opportunities would go a long way towards elevating the magic in the short term. But 
the short term doesn't matter if it's not good enough to win the championship, which the Magic are not there yet. So the the goal here is you want to not change too much. You want to continue to force feed Franz and Paolo the basketball as much as possible over a longer period of time so you can get a really firm grasp on what they're good at and what they suck at. Then, when Paolo's a fourth or fifth year player, and Franz has even more experience than that, at that point, you can sit down as a front office, you can be like, okay, Paolo's played 350 NBA games now, you know, or, or 300, 250, however many it is. He's played a few hundred NBA games now. We have a good grasp of what he's getting much better at and what his like true weaknesses are. Now we can look to really be more precise and deliberate with tweaks around those guys. But it's just like I was talking about with the Bulls. You have to find out what you have first. What we know about Franz and Paolo is that they have a world of potential. But we have no idea how much of that potential they're going to reach and what specific areas they're going to get better at and what specific areas they're going to struggle with. Like, what if we don't know? Is Paolo going to become better and better as a playmaker over time or better and better as a scorer over time? Is Paolo going to be a guy that becomes a really good jump shooter or is the jump shot never going to come around? Because if the jump shot's never going to come around, that alters his ceiling a little bit. Same goes for Franz, right? So in the short term, you don't want to jump the gun. You want to give these guys opportunities so you can learn about them in real detail about what they're going to be when they're in their prime so that you can then build around them at that point. Patience is key with young players. Uh, that's all I have for today. I have one last uh, uh, point. If you guys are into Rings of Power, my buddy Luke and I this morning just recorded like 45 minutes breaking down that crazy episode seven of uh, the penultimate episode of Rings of Power. So you can find that on my YouTube channel, which is Two Sons Podcast, or wherever you get your podcasts under Two Sons Podcast. Don't forget to hop over there and support that. We're done for the weekend. I'll be back on Monday to cover the Lakers and read everybody complain about it in the comments. I'll see you guys then.